it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce today Shiva Mihan, who is a postdoc fellow in the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Her work focuses on um, Perso-Islamic arts of the book from the 13th to the 19th century. And she has previously, uh, previously been the Schroeder Curator, um, Curatorial Fellow of Islamic Art at Harvard Art Museum. She received her PhD in Persian Studies from Cambridge in uh, 2018, and her dissertation, Timurid Manuscript Production, The Scholarship and Aesthetics of Prints uh, by um, Sungor uh, Royal Library, was awarded the Leigh Douglas Memorial Prize by the British Society for Middle Eastern Studies. Her forthcoming book on manuscript production in Timurid, Iran, will be published next year by Edinburgh University Press. And she's also the founding president of the Persian Manuscript Association. Shiva, we're thrilled to have you here today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dan, for this very nice introduction. It was really lovely to meet you and your colleagues today. Thank you so much for uh, having these seminars and for inviting me. Um, I think I should share my screen now. Okay. Okay, before I start, I should say that this is still a work in progress and um, I would be happy to have any comments, feedback and related data. My lecture focuses on text and transmission as is the tradition of Tetra seminar series, but this time I will take you 600 years back uh, to a royal library that was active in the first half of the 15th century in greater Iran. The significance of this library is not only in the exquisite manuscripts that they produce, but also because they prepare new text editions for the patron, Prince Baisungur, this guy here. The patron and his manuscripts are very well known in uh, Islamic arts of uh, the book and to Islamic art historians. And uh, his corpus has been regarded as one of the pinnacles of Persian arts of the book. It seems appropriate to start my presentation by introducing him. So uh, his name, Baisungur, means Master Falcons or Master Falcon. And as his name suggests, uh, he had a passion for falconry and hunting with birds of prey. Besides being a great army leader uh, who won all the battles, uh, he was fond of um, partying and courtly feasts. Uh, and in his royal garden, he was always carousing and drinking and uh, the musicians, as you see in this picture, were playing. He died at the age of 35 because of drinking too much wine. And um, he was a Timurid um, prince, as I said. And um, a little bit about the Timurid dynasty, um, I think Timur is known in the West by the name Tamerlane, and uh, Baisungur was the grandson of Tamerlane. Um, Timur founded the Timur dynasty in 1370, and uh, they ruled Iran until the beginning of the 16th century. Prince Baisungur established his royal atelier and library in Herat around 1420, which accommodated some 40 scribes and a team of painters illuminators, illustrators, designers, bookbinders, pigment producers, tent makers, and architects. The supervisor of all artistic and architectural projects was a person called Jafar Tabrizi. We know about 40 manuscripts from Bison was library produced within 15 years. His corpus has attracted ample scholarly attention for more than a century since 1912. However, there are some aspects of his celebrated library that have not been properly investigated or introduced. Especially in Western scholarship, um, only the art of the book has been the center of attention and studied without stepping any further into the content of the works. 
They are such magnificent manuscripts and so sumptuously illustrated that I don't blame scholars for being trapped in the beauty of the, um, of the paintings uh, and illuminations of these manuscripts. And the fact that few scholars knew Persian language well was also another reason. So for the first time, I looked at the textual content during my PhD research. And um, that was probably because I was applying a multidisciplinary approach to the study of the text. And text was crucial in order to understand not only the relation between text and image, but also to understand the scholarship and a real function of the library. When I studied the textual content, I realized that the texts were different from those copies made before or contemporary to Bicentral's manuscripts. And this gets more meaningful when we find that at the beginning of at least three manuscripts, the prince's command is mentioned for the collection and arrangement of the text, as you see here, or his order for correcting and purifying the book, which means that they were asked to prepare a new recension, if you will. An important and well-known recension uh, from Baisenwa's library is the Shahnameh. As you might know, Shahnameh is, um, Shahname is translated as the Book of Kings in the West, or literally it means King of the Books. It is the Iranian national epic and it was composed by Ferdowsi in uh, 1010. And it was copied during the realm of almost all the rulers in the Persian lands, not only in Iran. We have five different prefaces to the Shahnameh and chronologically, uh, Bison was copy is uh, the fourth um, preface that was composed for the prince. The new preface narrates the genesis of uh, the Shahnameh and its origins, and also it has stories from the life of the poet. In this preface, we read, Prince Baisengur sometimes occupied his time in perusal of the Shahnameh by Ferdowsi of Tus, who pierced the sparkling pearl in versifying it. Even though numerous Shahnameh uh, copies were disposed in the imperial library, they were not so refined as to be pleasing to the subtle disposition and the delicate nature of the prince. The royal order was received that from several copies, one should be corrected and completed. And this is very important as it is hinting at the motives and um, the methodology uh, behind the preparation of the text, collecting and correcting or editing. There are two copies of the Bicentenary recension of the Shahnameh penned by two different, sorry, two different scribes, three months apart. When I compared them, I found that um, surprisingly, they do not contain the same text, uh, nor an identical preface. The preface in the hand of Jafar, this one on the left, uh, who was the head of the library, has omissions, additions, and alterations. Some modifications are limited to uh, one or a few words, but some are um, um, a paragraph long. Like this paragraph praising the prince and emphasizing how art had flourished and the life of artists and scribes had improved under the prince's patronage. The entire paragraph is absent in the other copy. In another instance, the religion of Ferdowsi, the poet, in this other copy is referred as um, referred to as Rafadi, which has a negative connotation. But Jafar, who started his um, copying three months later, changes it to Shi'i, which is a respectful term. All those changes would suffice to demonstrate that Jafar's authoritative maneuver of textual contents. There is no doubt that he had a perfect understanding of the prince's taste, both in literary and in artistic features. 
So he manipulated the text to satisfy and please his patron to the fullest. Further investigations indicate that there must have been a council which decided on the scholarly matters. Uh, with the court historian, Hafez Abru, the chief librarian, oh, Jafar Tabrizi, and probably the princess calligraphy teacher, Shams Baisungori, who was an authoritative um, figure with similar influences like um, to the death of Jafar. The court had a large number of poets and literati. They were not short of scholars, philosophers, and erudite members, for sure, but the identity of those members in the council is not known to us. My study of the text confirms that they deployed different approaches to text editing and um, purifying the text. And they were following the prince's uh, commands very closely. The collective approach was their principle uh, in preparing new editions of several works of poetry. I use the word edition loosely here, uh, needless to say that their understanding of um, edition was totally different from what we have today. With that in mind, comparing the Bison words Shahname with two previous editions of the text, from the 14th century, one at the beginning of the 14th century, one at the end, reveals that their approach uh, was not similar at all. And Boysunger's attitude to text is quite unprecedented. Hamdullah Mustafi, for example, used several base texts and copied each section of the Shahnameh from one manuscript without make, making any amendments. In his recent study, Ali Shapuran demonstrated that in Baisangur's court, they did not follow a base text. Instead, they used several copies simultaneously. They looked at the text, chose the best variants, and then tried to include all the verses that they found in other copies to create their complete recension. This has been the main reason Iranian scholars have neglected the text because they think that there are a large number of interpolated verses and it doesn't worth studying. Completion and inclusion of all works of a poet in one manuscript was a major approach in that library. Bisonworth collected works of Haju Kermani is the first and most complete copy of all poetry and poets prose by the poet. The collected works of Emaduddin Fatih Kermani is another example. There is a historical account in Dolat Shah Samarkandi's Tazkirat al reporting that the prince had ordered the collection of all poems by Amir Khosru Dehlavi. And after they gathered 120,000 couplets, they found 2,000 previously unknown couplets elsewhere which resulted the prince calling off the project as it appeared impossible to collect all Amir Khosrow's poetry in one manuscript. In addition to collecting and aggregation, another approach was correcting and emendation, which they used in the Shahnameh, as I mentioned. Purification was another method for altering the text. It partly meant to omit Arabic words, and replace them with Persian equivalents. For example, instead of Bismillah Rahman Rahim, they used Benam Izad Bakhshayande Bakhshayishgar, which is pure Persian. This was a tradition in pre Ilkhanid manuscripts, which was principally abandoned by the um, 15th century, but they sort of revived it. We should notice that removing Quranic verses for Baisungur at the time that his father Shah Rukh was in power and he was such strict Sunni Muslim was not something simple. But Baisungur was not religious. And as far as I know, he almost never commissioned a religious text. He loved wine, which is prohibited in Islam. And the spectrum of the titles that he liked um, shows that he had a passion for words of wisdom 
poetry and history books. He also had a very specific taste and he was so clear about the choice of the text. Further part um, particularities of Weissenbord's editions have recently been studied extensively and in detail by my friend Alicia Furon, whose results can be summarized as follows. Their approach to editing varied from text to text, but they deployed certain criteria and principles. Their approaches include eclectic editing, collecting and aggregation, and summarizing the text. Their principles include deleting Quranic verses and religious phrases, in some cases, changing Arabic words into Persian as much as they could, using features particular to old texts. And in some cases, they updated the language by replacing complicated pronunciations with more contemporary ones by changing and by changing the old verbs. The prince favored the stylistic characteristic of old Persian texts um, from the Samanid and early Ghaznavid periods, 10th, 11th century. For example, they inserted conjunctions such as and, va, or then, pass, at the beginning of some sentences in Barsambar's copies. Those features are frequently found in Bal Amitari Khatabari, uh, as a, an example, and they did this um, sort of amendation, amendation of the text um, in the Golestan of Saadi, the manuscript that you see here. Also in the Golestan of Saadi, um, instead of making an aggregation by gathering everything that the poet had done um, from different sources and uh, copies, they summarized Saadi's work and even shortened his minimalistic anecdotes. Now the question is, who had the final say in the choice of literary approach? The court historian Hafez Abru was the mind behind historical texts. Uh, he rehashed his own words of Dr. Tabari, which is a history about um, Timurids up to the year 1427, over and over again. On the other hand, it seems that Jafar, the overseer of all projects, was the key figure in the choice of aesthetics, in calligraphy, illumination, and illustration. Boysonger's atelier followed the Jalayarit school of Tabriz and Baghdad and refined and perfected it. That was where Jafar was trained in the court of the Jalayarit and he is from Tabriz. He reapplied the illuminations and designs and patterns that he used to um, apply in pre bisongor manuscripts in the manuscripts that he produced for Bisongor. But was he similarly influential in literary context as well? We have evidence there are two copies of the same work. Jaffa transcribed a copy of the Divan of Hafez in 1419 with a text close to its contemporary copies. After Jaffa was appointed as a head of the library in 1420, a year after, and received the princely sobriquet by Songori, he penned another copy of the Divan of Hafez, this time for the prince. This copy is undated, but uh, according to its uh, stylistic features, I would date it to around 1425, 26, almost six years later. And we can observe um, a great number of variants in this copy. This almost proves that Jafar was unlikely to manipulate the text on his own. The ex libris inscriptions testify that Prince Baisongor demanded editing and correcting texts. He was a micromanager, being a Virgo. And although the chief librarian 
was an influential figure and could have affected the prince's um, visual taste. I believe that the textual content was entirely formed to favor prince's literary taste based on what he was demanding. So to conclude, text editing under Bryson Gore was not a haphazard interpolation of invalid verses, but it seems that they had a specific and clearly defined criteria. In other words, we're talking about a school of editing, but we should not judge the value of the final output by today's standards. The problem is that they have not explained their methodology and we are trying to understand their intentions and their attitude through textual comparison. But we can be certain that their methodology was not based on genealogy or systematology, which means that they were not trying to reconstruct any archetype close to the author's copy. Depending on textual content, they treated each text differently within the scope of their specific principles, of course. The scholarly council's approach changed from the Gulistan's words of wisdom to an epic poem like the Shahnameh, to stories of the Kalilo Demne, to history books such as the Zafarnameh of Shami. This is unprecedented way of correcting and editing text. It's quite rare and regardless of the literary value of the recensions according to today's criteria, their textual approach is worth studying at least for its uniqueness. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiva, for this fascinating and informative talk and also for showing and sharing with us all these splendid pictures of manuscripts. I am sure there will be a lot of questions. If you have one, you can raise your hand electronically, but maybe also your physical, we should be able to see it, or write it in the chat. If meanwhile there's none, I could maybe start us off with uh, I have plenty of questions, but I can start with one that is actually related to something you said at the very beginning, because you uh, talked about the text itself that the manuscript contains, but yes. you also mentioned that other studies focused on the uh, physicalities of this manuscript. So I was wondering, do we have any codicological features that identifies this collection as such? Anything that distinguishes this text, this manuscript from other texts or not? Yeah, so the stylistic features are very um, specific to these manuscripts and they are so uh, obviously distinguishable. So when you look at Prince Bersonger's manuscripts, you understand that, okay, this is definitely from his library. Um, the style of illustration is a little bit um, close to what they were doing at the end of the 14th century and the beginning of the 15th century under uh, Jalairid and also in the court of his cousin, Iskandar Sultan in Shiraz. Um, but the, the um, illuminations and the program of illuminating the manuscripts were quite uh, specific to this library. They are not being mistaken, yes. And there have been numerous studies about the illustrations, particularly few studies about the illuminations, like for you mentioning, not even illuminations were that much interested to scholars. But the text, I haven't seen anyone talking about it, except for Persian um, scholars to, um, criticizing the Shahnameh that was made under them, saying that this is like worthless. <laughs> so I hope I answered your question. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. Catherine, go ahead. Uh, hi, um, thanks for a fantastically interesting talk and sort of going on a little bit more on what you just said. Um, 
when you were working with these texts and, and looking at the editorial policy, like, did you notice, um, um, did the editing change the focus of a text? So, for example, when they were editing a history, what, what was the sum result of this editorial activity? Did it change the focus to make uh, the prints look um, much, you know, much more magnanimous? Uh, did they retell history to cover up any sort of any uncomfortable political past? Were, were you, did you have the opportunity to sort of make any assessment like that? Uh, thank you. This is extremely interesting question. Um, I think this is a very Western view to look at a um, library because there was similar uh, ideas about him illustrating himself, like these are the propagandistic um, representation of this prince. But I'm not sure if he would do that sort of things if he wanted to have such propaganda because he was the only person of the family who didn't build anything in the city to have his name on. And these manuscripts were in his personal library. So they were not you know, showing um, this prince and his figure as the future king that much in the um, society. He preferred to have actually a, a low profile because his dad was in power. Uh, about the text, we do not have uh, anything but that history text that um, was contemporary and talking about the contemporary events. And that one is mainly about his grandfather and his father and less about himself. But what we see after him in that text um, in all the art historical sources is that they really didn't say anything about his uh, figure as a warrior, uh, as an army leader. They were focusing on his love of art and what a great patron to the artistic stuff he was. So this is interesting to me, uh, both official and non-official texts um, emphasize on that. And that was the only text that was sort of contemporary. The other text had nothing to do with his contemporary events, with his figure as the king or a prince. They were all about, most of them were didactic works, um, mirror for princes genre, but uh, almost a century before he was born. So they were classical uh, literature that he was very much into them. But I think he had particular taste like, in that work of Saadi, the Golestan, has eight chapters. They covered the chapter on the manner of kings fully, but other chapters are not that much elaborate in that manuscript. So it means that he had this eclectic taste more than having something that shows uh, his grandeur or, you know, something like that. But I haven't been to all of the texts. Uh, for all the manuscripts yet, but that is my understanding that it was more his eclectic taste. Also, he has this manuscript of Chahar Magali of Nizami. And because he hated the astrologers, <laughs> they had a very unpleasant um, prediction of his ending, which was uh, came true actually at the end. But uh, he uh, ordered to omit that whole chapter out of that manuscript. So, which is so, so interesting. No, I don't think that there was anything that he was just like using it as propaganda. Oh, I'd, I'd admit that chapter too, I think. Yes. <laughs> no, thanks. That was, that's thank a, thank you. That's really, really interesting. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Dan, please. Thank you. I, I think uh, Ali has a question in the chat. Maybe we can go with that. Sure. There's plenty of sure. time for my question. Okay, sure. Uh, Ali, if you want to read that aloud yourself, please do so. Or ask okay, um, sure. I will. Thank you, dear Shiva, for the thought provoking lecture. As you mentioned, they modified the texts heavily, but in spite of some stylistic archaisms, they tried to make those works more contemporary, at least lexically. Uh, since in cases of at least Khoju and Emad Fari, uh, 
we have um, which they were contemporaries to themselves. How do you think the manuscripts would be modified regarding the fact that in some cases the Bayesian manuscripts are indeed the oldest survives, uh, survived ones, and so we can't compare them to the previous copies? Yeah, thank you so much for this question. Yes. Um, what is interesting about these two works that you named, the Khaju and Ahmad uh, Tinfari, is that, yes, we have the most complete copy from Baisungo's library. When I was doing this research on the text of the uh, Khaju Kermani's um, work, and uh, I, I went through all the something like um, 30 or 40 copies of his works from the time of poet, meaning 1350 to 1450, for 100 years, whatever was written. And I looked at the text very closely and I realized that they were very enthusiastic about really gathering everything by the, the uh, poet or the author. And it was so important to them not to miss a line anywhere. So I think that they had access to some previous manuscripts, even if they didn't, uh, they haven't come down to us and we are not aware, they had these manuscripts, they were gathering everything in one place. So Harju dies in 1353, I guess. And Bai Sungur's manuscript is um, 1426. And, and, and it is the most complete text. Um, I haven't done much um, research on the text. This is something that you should help me with on the text of the uh, Harju uh, and how stylistically it was different. But I see there are lots of variants. Although I haven't spotted if they were trying to make it a little bit more up to date, closer to their own language, or was there any other motive behind it? It was like another variant or something. So at least in those uh, features of gathering all the uh, couplets together, that criteria at least exists in those uh, copies too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thank you very much, Dan. And then we have Valentina. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. This was very interesting. It's a very, very interesting case um, because for the most cases that we work on, what we have, it's one manuscript with a recension of a text and then maybe two others with two different recensions. We never have, and then we are left to reconstruct um, whatever happened that we have now different versions. Whereas in, your, in what you're describing, you have a bit of access of how uh, to how that happened. In my case, I'm working on the reception of a group of texts um, in different languages. I would love to have <laughs> in any point of reception, the kind of background to explain how that, how we ended up with this, to, to fall on a situation where there is a clear center with a clear sort of patron who is, has uh, both, in, is both, um, how, how should I say that, um, has both method because you show that they try to do it in one way and it's also not impersonal, is the prince saying what he wants. Yes. That's, which is probably the rule everywhere, you know, one way or another that would be really golden for me to find. And I don't. So this is very interesting uh, in, in many ways. And um, what is more, um, I would, um, um, that was my um, comment uh, all, uh, all around the, on the paper. But my question is, you've mentioned this is a finite group of manuscripts, some 40, do I remember correctly? Yes. How are they distributed? today, because I've seen uh, some of them in Tehran, but then uh, Chester Beatty, some Oxford, some Ankara maybe at the beginning there was. I so, don't know, how, 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 how what's happened? 
Yes, um, they are scattered in 12 countries. And for my PhD, so I had to travel to 12 countries, but even there were like several cities in some countries that I had to go to see like in Manchester, in Oxford, in London, in Cambridge, within England. Um, not to mention that I had to go to Dublin as well, <laughs> several times. Um, yes, they are scattered everywhere. And it seems like because they were so um, beautifully decorated, everyone wanted to have one piece for their own collection or for their uh, libraries and museums. We have a few single folios here and there as well, especially in North America. But Ottomans plundered the entire collection, took it to Istanbul, and from not the entire, I'd say a few of them have survived, but from there, they were sold to everywhere, mainly to European collectors. And there were lots of art dealers in that uh, period, like 18th, 19th century. And we see that in the 20th century, they were all over the place. And some of them were brought back to Iran. Some of these um, military people were in contact and they were buying them, bringing them back to their collections and to the Imperial Library, for example. A few of them have survived within Iran, but this Shahnameh of Baisungur is, you know, Shahnameh is the most important text in Iran. And this manuscript is the most praised and important text to Iranian collections because this is the only manuscript that was not scattered like the ones before or after, and those manuscripts, you see that they are in, I don't know, one manuscript ended up in 30 collections or something like that, even more. But the people are so lucky about this one. <laughs> so yes, they were distributed everywhere. That's a very, very, very strange situation. You also get dispersion, both dispersion and dismembrance. People yes. broke them to pieces. Absolutely. This is a personal curiosity. Because um, um, as I go to my materials, I take notes. I have a special file. Do, do you do you have the situation where because you mentioned them being sold to especially European collections? Do you have uh, I have a file for this? <laughs> do you have a situation where you know that it was uh, bought by a Western collection and it perished in fire, in war, in that sort of thing? Because I do trace for my collection where, where this has happened, you know, as a counter to the yes. overgrowing, saving everything uh, narrative that we have. Yes, that's a very good question. I think it was a couple of weeks ago that I had, I had a um, conference celebrating the 600th anniversary of this library, like a couple of weeks ago, right? <laughs> and mm -hmm. I talked about this particular manuscript that ended up in the hands of European dealers and at some point, they try to, um, what, what, how can I say that, to split the folios. If the folios had something interesting on one side, like mm -hmm. a beautiful decoration, they were splitting the papers, pasting something on the other side, and selling these separately to other collections. So that one manuscript I reconstructed from four different uh, private and public collections bits and pieces, one in Freer Arts uh, Gallery, one in private collection, part of it for Harvard. And, uh, you know, so there we, we do have these sort of stuff. And I think that a process of reconstructing is such a joyful process for a um, scholar. Definitely. <laughs> you know, um, so I had to trace all of them from Christie's, where they were sold and who got them, going into, you know, communication with these guys um, discreetly, secretly, because, you know, the identity of the buyer has to be confidential. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yes, we do have names of people and we can guess if they did this sort of um, mutilation of manuscripts, or it was done some time ago in Istanbul before being sent and sold to these guys. Mm -hmm. We have some examples in the Dietz collection in uh, the Staatsbibliothek of Berlin, and we see that they, like they decorated the, the medallions, which we call Shamse, was cut as if by a knife mm -hmm. <laughs> and pasted in those albums. 
uh, which is so painful to see them. But yes, we do have a lot of them. We have the name of the dealers in some cases, and uh, painful to see. <laughs> it is painful to see. Yes. Uh, getting back to your um, description of what, whatever happened in the library as they wrote uh, this, I agree entirely that it, what's interesting there is not whether those texts can send us to any original, but the fact that they worked in a particular way with the text and those results and why and how. That, that's very interesting for me. Thank you. Yeah, much. absolutely. So um, I've been a painter and I did abstract painting and we were always telling everyone that the final result is not important. The journey that you have is the most important thing. I think in this case, it is the same because everything has changed. We don't have the same viewpoints. And we have to look at the mindset of a medieval literary scholar. Indeed, yeah, very interesting, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That brings me to something I was thinking about when we were talking to so, Valentina, if that's right for you, can I jump in and then go back to, thank you. Because I was wondering, we talked about how they, how they edited the text and you show it brilliantly that each manuscript has a specific uh, feature. So how would you edit the text? Because <laughs> from what you said, there's, there's little point in going back to the original, so to say. And uh, maybe in this, with this sort of test, the uh, no, classical stomatology and philology wouldn't be that useful. How would you do that? I think what happened was that what, what I understand from the text and documents is that the prince used to study and read these manuscripts and probably because they had this huge library and every um, royal library had ended up in their hands, he had access to all sorts of variants in different copies. He was going there, opening them, reading this particular story that he really loved and probably could recite it and finding some new lines, which was so annoying for him to see these things in every manuscript. And he wanted everything in one place. Um, I would do the same in this point. But the other thing is that, uh, yes, I would gather everything that I really loved in one place. Like I'm eating this chapter, I don't need that. <laughs> but it, that was not all he did. His taste was part of it, but he also was so aware of preserving the previous text. So in one instance, they have seven treatises that they are very rare. We do not have any previous copies for at least, I think three or four of them. And the other copies have just one or two in the whole world. And at the beginning of that, he is ordering to collect these rare treatises. So he was aware that these are rare and they are they worth um, being collected in one um, collection, one sort of majmua, one anthology. Um, I would, <laughs> I would agree. Yeah, so it is uh, the prince and uh, the cut object, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, fascinating. Thank, thank you. you. Valentina, thank you so much. please. Yeah, thank you very much for this. It was fascinating for me too. I'm a complete outsider to this, so I have more general questions. So uh, first of all, it was a personal library. Does it mean that it was only for him or it had a kind of uh, rayonment, a kind of uh, spread in the court or after his death since he died so young? Uh, yes. That's my first question. And the second question is, is that common that uh, so such a young prince does something like this in the cultural milieu you study or is kind of an individual really something which does something about his own personality, uh, which is what uh, it seems to me to understand also. Yes, very, very good question. Thank you. So what was your first question? <laughs> first question is if it was only for his own enjoyment yeah, right. or yes. it has a spread like uh, in the court or, or beyond that. So that was a very um, celebrated library, even at the time of the prince. It was so famous and everyone was writing about this particular library with so many stuff. It was um, a wonderful number of employees that were working there and everyone was in charge of something. 
the um, output of the library was going to the royal library of his own court, but his uh, father's palace was separate. And I think they had access to these too. Sometimes I felt that um, we do not have any, uh, you know, historical accounts, but I feel that sometimes they borrowed these manuscripts for the king. Um, but mainly he ordered his own library to produce manuscripts for his father uh, with a dedication to give this uh, poetry, beautiful poetry to the father. Father was very much into historical stuff, not very interested in poetry, but he gives this beautiful manuscript with lots of illustrations to his father. So he was the person, main person to use them, but they were not like no one else can touch them probably everyone in the court could sort of um, use these things, mainly for um, political guests, maybe, that was a sign of power and, um, you know, wealth to show them to the foreign uh, or diplomatic guests. And um, the other question about him being so young and doing these things, yes, it is, uh, everything about him is a little bit specific to him, but we do have um, his cousin right before him. He was died when Bison was around 1718, I guess, um, that kind of age. Uh, he was killed by Bison's father and he was uh, similarly a great patron, very different stylistic uh, features in his manuscripts, but he was like a role model to Bison where everyone loved that prince because of uh, his personality, because of their beautiful manuscripts and uh, because of the way he was ruling um, Isfahan and Shiraz. And I think Bison were had a look upon him and seeing him as a role model. And we can see that by seeing that, um, um, realizing that he had the same illustrations in his own manuscripts, depicting the same scenes as the cousin's uh, manuscripts, but replacing himself in place of that other patron. It was um, probably very sentimental for him. And the other reason was that maybe he owed, felt that he owed something that to that cousin because when he was he died the father brought all the treasure from his palace to Herat and they had access to all these beautiful manuscripts so some of the artists even ended up in Bicycle's court and um, he was young but he had a beautiful model in front of his eyes uh, his brother in Shiraz Ibrahim Sultan was also very young but um, he was a patron of manuscripts as well they were put into fierce education since the very young age, by the age of 14, 15, they had to be ready to be a ruler. So they knew literature, all the sciences of the time, uh, history, and they were ready. Uh, when he died at the age of 35, it wasn't a bad age for that time, but his dad was uh, ruling for 50 years. <laughs> so all of them were dead by the time of uh, his father. And his library was after him, his library was in the hand of the son for a few years until he was also defeated in some um, wars. And his brother, who was very just at the beginning, um, attacked Herod and plundered the library. Then it was plundered with lots of other rulers. But uh, how they, were observed by other people. Another brother was copying exactly the same word by word uh, preface that was just composed at the time of Baisongor for his own Shahnameh, but the text is different. So they didn't use the dissension, they used the preface, um, which is sort of interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Andy, please go ahead. I just wanted to continue with that, that line of thought because that was going to be my question. So is there any long lasting influence in terms of the innovations that happen in this period 
or is it just because it is a personal library? I mean, you mentioned that, of course, this preface that was copied, but is there any longer tradition? And also what you meant, I found it interesting what you mentioned, so that these sort of the Arabic, the Arabic in the in the text is often sent or, or exchanged for Persian word, for the Persian words, for Persian vocabulary. Is that also something that lasted? Is that something that reflected the language at the time? Or is that something related to sort of an identity question and trying to emphasize more the Persian language? Or did that reflect the, the status of the state of the spoken language at the time? Or is this also, or is this related to sort of the modern, well, modernization might be the wrong term of the, of the or the updating of the language of the text yeah. itself? Mm -hmm. So what is uh, the influence of his library? Yes, it lasted. It was a um, turning point probably continuation of the previous um, libraries like the Jalairit and the Skander Sultan, which I talked about, uh, refining and perfecting everything that they had done. And that lasted for the entire period of the Timurids. We see that it was more uh, elaborate as the time was uh, going by towards the end of the century, 15th century, at the time of Sultan Asim Bayadara, for example, the, um, almost the last ruler of the Timurids, we see that his manuscripts have a lot from the illuminations that were created under Bersungur, um, that style, but uh, they also change it to lots of um, detailed patterns and motives. So that was one part. The other thing is that they used this calligraphy style, script is called Nastali, and that's, uh, it was a newly generated and canonized uh, sc uh, script. They used it uh, in Library of Bison or very, very frequently. So we don't have that many examples of other scripts, but this script was very favorable for the prince. And we see that there are lots of students of this head of the library, Jaffa, that um, perfected this, um, of script generation by generation. And that was also an influence that was going through this library. Uh, yes. The other question that you asked was about the, um, the text and how they were looking at uh, the um, you know, alterations, archaism, and uh, how that persisted. I do not think that that was um, that much um, a center of attention for the next rulers. So we have this other Shahnameh um, in his brother court um, 10 years afterwards, and they didn't even notice that there was this recension. They didn't want to copy it. In later uh, times, I do not think that I have uh, noticed anything. Maybe I have not studied, but I do not think that they were uh, following this particular style and this approach in their textual studies. And we don't have, so by the end of the Timurid um, period, we have less and less people like the rulers that were interested in manuscript production. Most of the artists moved to India, to Turkey, and uh, they, they lost their, and, and we have this religious system, um, Safavids, who the Shah Tahmash, for example, this king was not really interested in anything, uh, sort of, uh, less interested in anything that was not religious. Very different. He prohibited wine. Baisongor was living on wine. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, thank you for Christian. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If I haven't missed anybody and there's, there are no further questions, I would like to thank you very much once again, Shiva, for this extremely fascinating seminar and uh, wish you all a good evening or day, depending where you are, and see you next time. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure meeting you. And yes, I think it's almost 11 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have a good week and uh, thank you everyone again. Thank you.